everybody again. This is more like a fireside chat. If you guys want to come up a little, move up a little bit, please feel free. Um, I'm glad I didn't do the audience response now, and I did it this morning, um, because it's a lot easier to do it now just by asking you to raise your hand. But um, I, I think, you know, all that being said with attendance, I think this topic is a nice segue given uh, our last session uh, that we had uh, Shauna talking about uh, protocols, um, you know, Luke about, you know, data acquisition or artificial intelligence and then summing it up with uh, uh, David Norris's talk on uh, emotional intelligence. And really what I want to do is share with you some work uh, that we've uh, completed uh, that was published last year assessing non-technical skills and practicing perfusionists. And so um, I, know, uh, I you know I'm one of two people that are holding you back from you know, enjoying some cocktails probably by the pool. So I only have two learning objectives for today is to um, take a few moments and share with you some of the elements of uh, human error in healthcare and then to describe some of the tools that are now becoming available special to perfusion about assessing our uh, technical skill or non-technical skills in the operating room. And so I want to start with this uh, illustration here. Um, there is a uh, sociology professor, his name is Charles Perot, and Charles Perot worked at Yale University Medical Center, and um, he studied um, very complex work environments. And he defined the complexity of a work environment based on how, how complex it was, but then how tightly coupled uh, activities are. And if you look at this, um, this uh, box here, cardiac surgery is in this corner here uh, in a tightly coupled and in a complex environment. So what, that, what does that mean? Uh, by being coupled, tightly coupled, that means that you know, something that happens in the operating room has an effect on what happens with other people. You know, I, I once worked for this surgeon and um, you know, he joked around about it, but he said, you know, if perfusion speaks up, if they have a problem, we need to listen, we need to stop and listen, because if they're not happy, then the rest of us shouldn't be happy. Um, and so what happens at the surgical field has an impact on us, what happens on the heart-lung machine has an impact on the patient and the job that the surgeon can do. And so our uh, tasks are very tightly coupled. And we work, as you know, in a very complex environment. If I were just to point out here, you know, the other high-risk industries that are found in this quadrant, you know, you have nuclear power, uh, nuclear weapons, chemical plants, uh, aircraft, space missions. So you can see we're nestled in a pretty tightly complex work environment. And uh, he went on to say that accidents are inevitable in complex, tightly coupled technological systems, regardless of the skills of the people that work within them. Uh, so it's inherent that we're going to run into failure from time to time. And to be quite honest, you know, we're fallible as people. Uh, we make mistakes. Um, we're human beings, and working in this tightly complex environment, we're prone to make errors. And sometimes it's the system that prevents us from making the errors. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done. You know, Shauna did a really nice job this afternoon talking about, you know, the frequency of adverse events and errors. Um, but if we really do a root cause analysis and go back and look at, you know, how errors occurred, 86% um, of those adverse surgical errors are really based on system errors, breakdowns within the system, and not necessarily the technical skill of the individual. You know, and I see this, I see this in my role as, a, as an educator at MUSC all the time because, you know, in our traditional educational model that we teach people to become perfusionists, we educate them to become the perfusionists, and traditionally that's very siloed, right? Perfusion students are in a classroom and then they're in simulation, so they do all of their foundational learning together uh, as a group, as, as one class, but then what we do is we kick them out of the nest and send them to the operating room where they're working with everyone. They're working with surgeons and anesthesiologists and nurses and techs, and now they have to kind of learn by trial by fire how do you work within a system, within a team. And so um, we have to break down some of those silos and have you know medical students and um, um, and, and nursing students and perfusion students all working together because the more that we can appreciate and understand what they do, the better we're going to be as colleagues and being able to effectively communicate and collaborate. 
And then lastly, 40% of interoperative errors are due to lapses or breakdowns in communication. And this also, um, is, there was a similar statistic provided by the Joint Commission that two thirds of all you know, hospital-based adverse events are because of lapses in communication. It's not that technically you don't know or don't, or you be able to master what you're doing. It is you know, the people and the environments that you work in. And um, the Agency uh, for Healthcare Research and Quality in 2014 identified the eight common root causes of medical errors. And what I want to draw your attention to is that point number seven, bullet point number seven here is technical failures. Um, the, the aspects of, you know, somebody didn't do what they were supposed to do uh, because they, they didn't have the technical skill to do it. The other seven bullet points here are all non-technical errors. Uh, the way in which we communicate, uh, the flow of information. So early this morning, you know, we watched a demonstration of, of two individuals, you know, documenting during a simulated uh, cardiopulmonary bypass procedure how much attention was a focused away from the patient and onto a manual record versus what was being electronically captured. Um, so there, there could be um, inadequate information flow that exists. Um, patient related issues, you know, we can't control how sick the patients are coming into our service line. Of course, you know, there's a cognitive overload that can occur when we're asked to do more with less. Uh, staffing patterns and workflow, you know, I, I think you can attest to the fact that, you know, there's a staffing shortage across a number of different healthcare specialties. And we're asked to, you know, still keep the lights on, you know, while we're working understaffed and um, we're seeing, you know, a significant amount of fatigue uh, occur with our uh, colleagues uh, just from having to pick up, you know, all that extra time that would otherwise be spent elsewhere. And then sometimes, as Shauna said, you know, inadequate policies. Do we really have a protocol that reflects what it is we actually do? It's one thing to say, yes, I have a protocol, here it is. But if your protocol hasn't been updated in seven years and it no longer reflects what your contemporary practice is, then it's, it's, it's not worth the paper that it's on. So when she asked the question about how frequent it should be updated, my answer would have been every year. Um, and that you don't necessarily have to make changes to it, but just read it once a year and see if it still reflects what it is that you guys do. Um, and, I, and I think this is pretty important. Um, you know, we had seen not, not too long ago, actually, just a, a month or two ago, um, some of you have, might have seen the, uh, in, the, in the news about, you know, a nurse working at Vanderbilt and, you know, having a pretty adverse event, uh, administering uh, vecuronium to a patient when she otherwise was expecting to give Versed. Uh, and that patient had a uh, sentinel event and subsequently died from it. Well, just very recently, she was, um, she was found, um, uh, she was convicted, and now is, has been uh, convicted of uh, involuntary manslaughter and will be sentenced in a couple weeks. Um, and a lot of people are concerned, concerned, of course, because, you know, she made this, she had this critical error, but she did the right thing in reporting it right away when she found out what it was. And so is this going to have a adverse or detriment to, you know, people being able to speak up and say, hey, I made an error, let's, let's, you know, hey, help me, I made an error, let's try to fix this. Is this going to, you know, wax and um, wane how often we disclose these things when we make an error? Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. We don't know all the details, of course. You can only, you know, gather so much from the news, but it appeared to be a system error when she was typing in, you know, VE for Versed. Um, it actually was cataloged under midazolam, its, its brand name, but then uh, she opened the drawer and pulled out the vecuronium, right? So she, she made a critical error in not doing those, those proper safety checks. But um, the article did say, too, that that system, that electronic cabinet that's affixed to Epic, um, didn't work very well. And in fact, you know, it was common practice for the staff people to override that safety system. And in that particular patient's case, she was in the, that patient was in the hospital for three days. There were 20 overrides of that system by various healthcare providers, not just this nurse. And so sometimes we're only as safe as the systems that we work in. 
So um, this is an illustration showing you the models of quality here, right? So when you think of quality, what do you think of? You think of you know, data collection, outcomes, quality improvement. Well, we know the data that exists in our patients, right? You know, we can, we can see how many chronic illnesses that we have. We can see you know, what their risk scores are. You know, we can do Euro scores and STS risk models to determine you know, how well or not well that they'll wind up doing during surgery. Uh, we know the organizational factors, right? How many cases that we do a year, our, 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 our structure and our process of how we care for patients, and we know how to measure complications at the end, right? Whether or not they've had a stroke, whether or not they've been diagnosed with AKI, but uh, in here is the black box, right? This is the OR black box. This is what, you know, we want to better understand you know, exactly how care is conducted in the operating room because, of course, that has a big impact on complications. And we're very good at the technical things, right, at least measuring the technical things, not so much about being able to measure and assess the non-technical things. And so um, there are um, organizations and people in this space of uh, human factor psychologists and engineers that have helped us better understand how to assess some of those non-technical behaviors. So by definition, a non-technical skill or behavior is an aspect of performance in the operating room which underpin medical expertise, use of equipment, and drugs. And they really fall under three categories. They're cognitive. The cognitive would be things like situational awareness, uh, decision making, um, social aspects like your ability to effectively communicate and um, your level of teamwork and leadership with people that you are that are in the operating room, and then the uh, personal resource factors. You know the current stress level in the operating room, or perhaps the level of fatigue. You know how many people have you know worked 24 straight hours on call and you know expected to stay for another case. I mean these are some of the psychological. And, and physical impacts that we place on ourselves by trying to play that superhero role, right? So these types of things are measurable. And we're not pioneers here. That This type of uh, non-technical skill assessment happens in other uh, high-risk industries, uh, industries that are highly reliable organizations. You'd see offshore drilling, aviation, aerospace, you know, they um, are preoccupied with failure. They preoccupied with the conditions and the circumstances that allow them to identify what are the common themes that occur when there is an error. Go back and let's recreate that process and develop what the root cause is. And many times it's teamwork and communication, right? Um, is there anyone in the audience that's a Formula One fan? Okay couple here. Um, so I'm going to play this video for you. Um, this was, uh, I believe, the Red Bull team, and this was in 2019. And this car, this Formula One car, is, is going to come in for a pit, uh, for a pit stop. And during a pit stop, the things that you would normally expect to have happen is the tires get changed, car gets refueled, uh, they assess any mechanical issues, and then they want to get this car as quickly back out into the road as possible because, you know, every second matters. So I'm going to go ahead and play this video for you. So that's 1.88 seconds. Um, and at that time, of course, as you had seen at the top of the screen, that was the world record. Uh, I've come to find out it's actually 1.82 seconds now. Uh, so it's even shorter than that. Um, but I, I think a couple of things that you might have taken away for that is, God, how many people were around that car for that 1.88 seconds? I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty fascinating. And if you look from an aerial view here, you can see that um, everyone has a job to do here, right? And everyone's job here is critically important. You can imagine what would happen if the person who is the front wing adjuster or the tire gunner here on the left doesn't do their job to task that, 
now there could be a significant issue with how this car takes off and then handles on the road. So you can see everyone has a job, it's important. Everyone is aware of the situation, so they have good situational awareness, right? They understand what the task is of hand. They're monitoring the situation, so if one of these people has trouble with their job, that they know there's somebody else there that's gonna, hap that's gonna help them. Uh, if they do communicate in that 1.88 seconds, that um, they have a system to be able to do that. And, you know, this to me is the one picture that's the quintessential teamwork picture, right? And it wasn't always like this. In fact, if you go back to Formula One racing in the 50s, the average pit was 67 seconds. So this process has improved over time. By the 1970s, it was 27 seconds. And now, of course, as I said, you know, in 2021, it's 1.82 seconds. Some of that is improvements in the technology, but some of that is improvements in the design of teams, teams being able to effectively do this. And like I said before, this is measurable in other industries. Um, and you can see, you know, we take these risky interventions uh, we have people who specialize in this space of human factors engineering observe and then help us create these tools for us to be able to use and assess non-technical skills as clinical professionals. And um, the, uh, probably one of the professions that started with this was surgeons. Uh, so this is the non-technical skills taxonomy for the surgeons or NOTS. Uh, this was developed by the University of Aberdeen uh, uh, um, uh, Medical Center in Scotland. Uh, Dr. Stephen Yule, who's a human factor psychologist, uh, runs that program now. And uh, he's worked very closely with healthcare providers, with surgeons in developing these non-technical skill assessment tools. In fact, you know, in talking to him recently, what he's working with right now is even much higher than that. He's working with NASA in helping to develop a way to be able to do surgery in space. Uh, and how you communicate, you know, across, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of miles to be able to have a team based here communicating with a team in space. Um, but they were able to um, create these four different categories. Uh, situational awareness, which is the way in which we gather information and how we understand the information and then project and um, try to anticipate uh, when things occur. Uh, decision making. Decision making is considering all the options that are available, right? And then selecting and communicating these options and then implementing them. Uh, communication and teamwork is our ability to exchange and share information with our colleagues. Uh, establish a shared understanding and coordinate team activities. These are the types of things that ideally is what a surgical timeout or, a, you know, if you call it a pause, you know, before the case starts, this is where some of this information should be shared. Um, you know, if it's, if you're taking that process of, you know, the surgical timeout seriously, then you're ensuring that everyone has a shared mental model about what we're supposed to do. Uh, also, you know, what the situation is with this patient, what we intend to do, any potential unintended consequences that, that may occur. Um, and that team should come away with a pretty good understanding of exactly what it's intended of them. And then our ability to uh, exercise leadership. You don't have to have a title to be a leader. Uh, leadership is, is vital in every aspect of life. Um, our ability to support others. So if I see, you know, a, a, a scrub nurse, for example, falling behind a little bit, you know, I have to be able to stand up and to say, hey, everybody, can we, you know, can we stop a second? You know, this, this, this person might need our help. Or if I see an anesthesiologist struggling and I'm off bypass, I'm gonna be the first one to come around. You know, I'm an extra set of hands here, how can I help? So we have to be able to support one another and then obviously cope with pressure because there's always pressure in what we're doing, right? And you would think, well, that's pretty easy to measure, right? Um, well, um, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, they say. So this was a study that was conducted uh, in uh, six different hospitals in Norway just a few years ago. And they asked uh, the surgical team, which consisted of uh, operating theater nurses, anesthesiologists, and surgeons. And they wanted to assess wanted to assess their perceived uh, ineffective communication or ineffective non-technical skills, right? So 
this first one here is um, exchanging information that the anesthesiologist kept the surgeon informed about the surgery. Now, the surgeon says 42% of that time uh, it was inadequate, but the anesthesiologist, nurse, and nurse anesthetist all thought it was closer to 80%, so there's a difference in perception. I love this one, uh, establishing a shared understanding. The surgeon communicated and planned the procedure. Well, 95% uh, of the time the surgeon thought they did that adequately, but at least half of all the other people in the room said that was inadequate. Um, and then lastly, um, surgeon checking preoperatively whether the whole team is ready to start the procedure. 88% of the time they said, yep, that's appropriate. And um, everyone else said, no, not so much. You know, at least a half to two thirds said, no, no, that, wasn't inappro that was uh, inappropriately done. So perceptions vary between professions, right? So we can't just subjectively say, you know, yes or no, this is good non-technical performance. So we need these skills uh, and these rubrics, these scoring systems to observe these behaviors, categorize them, understand the context, and then quantify the behavior. If we can measure it, then we can improve it. So, um, as I said before, uh, there are assessment systems for surgeons, for anesthesiologists, for scrub techs. Um, it only felt appropriate that perfusion has one that's specific to them, right? The, the only key question was, do we call it pints or do we call it pants? So we needed a fancy acronym for it, and as you can imagine, we called it pints. Um, but so we created this scoring system with the help of human factor psychologists that aligned fairly closely with the NOT system. And we can rate these behaviors uh, from good to poor uh, with delineations, of course, of course, here in the middle. I'm actually going to share with you one of those experiences here in a moment. So we, uh, there was a bunch of us that created at least this proposed taxonomy. And then what we did is um, during AMSEC's 2020 conference, so this was the very last conference right before COVID shut us down. Um, we were there in St. Louis and what we did was we used the audience as our research group and they participated via audience response, and we played for them a series of videos. And uh, I'm gonna play in just a moment a clip of one of those videos. You might have seen them before. Uh, they were videos that were created several years ago by AMSEC, simulation videos, uh, with different aspects of the surgical timeout with process of surgery. And we asked the audience to rate those behavioral skills after we introduced the pint system to them. So we gave them about a half hour primer on what pints is, what the scoring system was, and then we asked them to rate each of those behaviors in this session. And uh, it was on an eight point Likert scale, and I'll go through some of the results here in a minute, but I'm gonna play this video. And uh, I've already biased you because the title of it is this is a pretty poor preoperative briefing, but tell me that you haven't seen something like this before. I thought the surgeons were going to be down here for this. Do we're, we're going to do some huddle or something now? Yeah, yes, they're supposed to, and they know they're supposed to be here. Just let me finish this count and I'll call them. Five, six, you go through this every day. Eight, nine, ten. Okay, just do your hypos in a moment. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I'll call them now. Go through this every day. All right, Dr. Sound, we're ready for a briefing in room 46. All right, thanks. He's on his way. Jen, it's Denise and 46. We need you down here for the briefing. All right, thanks. Bye. They're both on their way. I'll be in the bump room. So let's finish the comics. I'm waiting for that. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a okay. Can we get this uh, this briefing going? I've got a, got patients in the office waiting for me. I've got sick patients in the ICU. Okay, let me get Bill. Room. He left the room while we were waiting. Listen, first of all, he is the annular shape ring. We need, he's got a low EF. We need a balloon pump, and we use Del Nido Plegio. Okay. Listen, uh, okay, Bill's on his way. Really Bill's on his way. Endocarditis yeah. case tomorrow. Prosthetic endocarditis. He's 85. He's got a bad ventricle. Are, are you guys talking about me? No, no, no. We're no. not. 
Okay, we're sorry, sorry, we forget. Um, we're you, talking about something we're else. We're concerned about the, the, his mitral valve as well, so we'll need to have a good echo. To okay, so we'll Bill's here. Let's, let's go. Well Can we get this briefing going? Yeah. Everybody yeah, listening? Yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk about you for a minute. This is about okay. you. So this is Mr. Grace, medical record 0103466, and he has an allergy to penicillin. So what are we doing for procedure? We're doing a mitral maze cavity. Okay, what type of valve? We're going to repair the valve. Do you need anything special for equipment or implants? I don't think so. Any like critical or non routine do. steps? I hope not. Any away concerns? Nope. Okay. Any antibiotics? Gonna give them. Uh, just remind me he's allergic to penicillin. Anything special for bypass? No. Um, any, I have to check. We have blood. I forgot. I'm sorry. Um, no. But when, when, you, when you got all that stuff figured out, I got a lot of patients up in the unit. But the stop from yesterday is sick. Call me when you're ready for me. Okay. I'm gonna call about the blood and then we can finish the count. So um, I, I should have done some uh, preface on that. So that was a video, a series of videos that were created up in Boston with a partnership between the Brigham and, and Mass General. So some of the people that you'd seen playing the roles, uh, Dr. Tor Sunt, who was the surgeon, who um, coincidentally is like a, a, you know, one of the you know, world's largest advocates of patient safety, you know, playing this role is pretty funny. Uh, Bill Riley, who was the perfusionist. And I don't know who the nurse was, but they told me that she's like that every day, that she didn't act for that role at all. So um, that's the way she usually is, I guess, Nurse Ratchet. Um, so uh, that was one of four videos. And so we had them assess each of those videos. So, you know, some of the things if you were able to pick up on is that um, there, there really were, f you know, some domains that were fairly low scored. Here's our eight point system from good to poor. So it was from 0 0.5 to 4 with uh, uh, half point increments. And we asked the audience about their, you know, whether or not there was situational awareness amongst the team and the perfusionist, decision making, task management, and then communication and teamwork. Some of the things that really resonated with me was that, um, you know, so there, there, there are moments from starting the briefing, Bill leaves the room. Um, but then when the surgeon comes crashing in through the room, they, um, they actually start talking about the case before they've even assembled the group. And um, I'll, I'll give you away, if you haven't seen these videos, it's on the AMSEC website, but I'll, I'll, I'll give part of it away if you haven't. You know, he said to the circulator, I'm gonna use Del Nido cardioplegia. Well, Bill doesn't know that. So Bill set up for a different cardioplegia because he wasn't in the room for it. And uh, other things that were, you know, tip-offs, you know, you could tell the surgeons looking at his watch while they're going through the process. So it, it kind of, you know, squashes the idea that he's engaged in this, like he's got better places to be. Um, even when they're doing the timeout, that Bill's back behind the pump, you know, fixing the pump up. So he doesn't really seem like he's engaged either in this process. And then um, lastly, that, you know, they're talking about another patient while they're, you know, getting ready to manage this one. I had asked the question, do you guys usually do your pauses while the patient's awake? And the answer is yes. That's what they do um, because they want the patient to make sure that the patient is informed and aware, hey, you know, this is what we plan to do. Do you have any questions? You know, this is the way in which, you know, this is what we discussed before, but this is the way in which we're going to manage you. Uh, so they normally do that with the patient awake, not talking about another patient, of course, but um, you can see why, you know, um, the wheels might start to unravel in this case because of this poor briefing. So we asked people to score this as well as three other videos. And you can see here the years of experience that were in the audience. So there were only about 66 people who filled out all four. So any impartial responses we didn't uh, analyze. Uh, but you can see the levels of experience that are here uh, that uh, participated in this. And what we found um, not, not surprisingly, what we found was that, you know, there were two videos that were pretty poor, there were two videos that were pretty strong, and so you see the scores were more likely to be either really poor or really strong. We didn't have videos that would demonstrate, you know, probably middle of the road, right? So that might be something, an opportunity for us to create more of these to assess. Um, and interesting, one of the things that we did find was that if you had less than five years experience, that you were more inclined to give a video a poor score 
as opposed to individuals that had more than 15 years experience that were inclined to be less likely to give a poor score. Maybe it's just because we've seen our share of really rotten you know, uh, timeouts over our long careers, right? Um, and then same uh, conversely with uh, really good scores, that the more experience that you have, the more likely you are of giving it a better score than people that were less than five years. Again, probably not enough of a, um, of an N of a sample size to say, you know, there's, there's you know, clear association here. Um, but what we did find was that using this tool, we were able to um, find, you know, um, some correlation that it, it correlated pretty closely with people's scores. Using the tool that we had, we were able to identify with fairly close correlation here, correlation coefficients of, of above 0.7 uh, to suggest that, yeah, the tool was fairly reliable at assessing someone's non-technical skills. So um, I'm going to close because I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions on this. But so where do we go from here? Um, so this, this was published in JTCVS. Now what we're working to do is uh, create more videos uh, to get them out into the community to allow, you know, practicing perfusionists to measure some of these skills. Uh, so, you know, have them posted on, you know, uh, media platforms that will allow participation. We also see opportunities to continue to uh, build structure in this process, not only professionally with having you know, more sponsored events at conferences like this, but as educators, Shauna and I and you know, the other 17 perfusion directors, how do we formally institute this at the foundational level of perfusion education? Um, you know, yes, we, we, we teach them things like you know, teamwork and communication, but now we actually have a tool where we can formally assess it. Um, what, what, what you find if you work with students, what you find is that in the beginning when they start pumping in cases that you know they have tunnel vision they're just looking at their reservoir and their pump flow the entire time right because that's you know they have conscious competence which says I can do this but I really have to concentrate right but they they don't have a clear picture around the room with regard to what's happening at the surgical field or you know what you know keeping an ear open to what the, the discussion you're hearing between anesthesia and the surgeon. Um, but the more cases they do, the more experience they get, you know, their field of vision starts to open up. So that's when we know they're getting close to graduating is that, you know, you could ask them at any point of the procedure, what are they doing right now? What's the, what stage of the procedure they're in? And they understand because they see fundamentally with experience what's happening. Can we use that tool to say, yep, you know, not, I believe you because now I can, I can measure it. Um, we also um, want to, you know, in create formal curriculum for simulation, so you can do this in a simulation environment. So we're not only just assessing whether or not somebody has good technical skills, but um, their ability to exercise their non-technical skills at, at, as well. And taking that information then, and then being able to allow them to assess their own skills, you know, having them you know, what, what we're starting to do now is record their sessions and allow them to go back and review their recording and reflect and say, okay, where were your opportunities to communicate better here? You know, you turned away for a second, I stole your venous return, I sucked your reservoir dry, you didn't realize that. Where were the opportunities here, you know, to be more situationally aware of what was happening during the case? So it allows for some degree of reflection. So um, in conclusion, what I would say is that this non-technical skills as it is really, you know, is really something that is, is newly becoming available for our profession and hopefully with time, you know, we can, you know, leverage it, learn from it and, you know, have safer and collaborative healthcare practices with our colleagues. And implementing these would benefit the community in not just the formative educational stages, but in continuing educational offerings as well. And then the continued development of this PINTS tool will only further help increase the reliability and validity of, of being able to assess discrete behaviors. Um, so with that, thank you so much again for your time. Thank you for staying late today, and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you.